Hey classes, welcome back. I'll try and talk a little bit louder since I don't have my microphone on because I think I'm gonna to have to go to the board a couple times today and I don't think it stretches that far. We've talked about a little bit of everything regarding fungus the last couple of days. We've been looking at the inside of a cell regarding the organelles that are there and what they're doing and we're kind of comparing and contrasting the cells that make up things like this mushroom, the fungus, with things that make, oh, say an oak tree, where I get these acorns here, to us, animal cells. Now the weird thing about the fungus right here is it's a heterotroph, just like us. It essentially eats. Well, really what a fungus does is it breaks down material for food, while trees, of course, when we looked at the plant cells under a microscope, photosynthesize, as evident by their green chloroplasts. So let's jump on in. I'll go through today's uh, notes. I'll talk a little bit about uh, beer and wine like we did the other day. And there's a reason I use beer and wine instead of bread. It, because of the particular shape of a graph. So flying through the notes today, we checked out how fungi reproduce. Uh, most produce spores, all produce spores, but uh, I was gonna say most are asexually uh, reproduced. However, they can do sexual reproduction as well, which of course mixes the genetic material, especially as we get into more on evolution and natural selection, change with modifications, descent with modifications. We'll be talking about why it's so important to have variety in your genetic material, but also the number of spores produced by something like this is absolutely astronomical. As an example, uh, I was using this now stale piece of bread, uh, old piece of sourdough in class as an example of something that it's left outside. There's gonna be spores that land on it, I can guarantee right now, there's probably tens of thousands of spores ready to digest this bread. Um, if a spore lands on it, I can't see it, it's microscopic. Um, in the case of a plant, the way plants reproduce, uh, if a seed were to fall on that, we kind of obvious if an acorn was sitting on it. You're talking about a strategy for reproduction where in any given room like this classroom right now, there are tens of thousands of spores floating around all the time, floating around and landing on things, trying to find something that they can digest. And when you're looking at a mushroom, you're looking at the fruiting body, the reproductive part of a fungus. Um, where do we find seeds in a plant? For most plants, this is not all plants. As a matter of fact, some plants produce spores. We're talking about 90% of plants though produce seeds in a fruit. Um, seed plants are by far the dominant form of plants on the planet and you can probably as we saw in class figure out why seeds can stick around for a long time and then wait for conditions to be just right before they germinate uh, this is considered alive but in a dormant state it's got all the food ready to grow to grow to go to grow a new oak tree i picked these up on the way back from uh, california state university chico just a couple of days ago out in the central valley this would be the time of year to uh, collect acorns if you wanted to get some food to get you through the winter. And as a little side trip, I was talking about uh, my first year teaching way back in 1999 with St. Gregory's School. We went down to uh, Yosemite. It was a fantastic trip with the eighth graders. There were 33 eighth graders, 11 per group, and our group was led by a naturalist in the Yosemite Institute. A fantastic trip if you ever get to it on this large rock as you approach Yosemite Falls at the very, very top. Most people wouldn't have bothered to try to make it to the top of this rock because it had sheer sides and it wasn't you know, very climbable. But uh, they brought a little ladder and we went up to the top. You could actually climb up there too with a little bit of effort. And you found these little dents in the rock. That was where the Native Americans would grind these into a paste. Uh, they have to rinse them quite a bit to get out the tannins and to get out the uh, very, um, very, very acidic taste to them. But then that right there would get them through the winter months. It makes kind of like a mush. They made some for us there right in the Yosemite Institute. It tasted very bland, really, but you can, of course, flavor it up. And they also kept it in these large, I'm gonna borrow my cups over here that we used in class today. They kept them, the Native Americans kept them in these large cylinders that they had woven together, obviously not plastic. And they had put on these cylinders um, pine needles pointed downward. And I was challenging students, why would you do that? And of course, they kept rodents out that strategy of these little pointy things going down like that, we're going to see that when we talk about, for example, the cilia in our lungs and how the cilia points a certain direction to keep materials from going down into our lungs. Why it's such a bad idea to smoke or vape because, of course, what it does is it destroys those little hairs that protect us from breathing in tox uh, toxins that are carried by, uh, say, dust particles. So that was a really cool example of not only 
something from California here, but uh, one of the important food staples of the Native Americans. Moving on, we talked about how my seeds, seeds spread far from the tree. Now, in the case of these acorns here that I collected, they were right beneath the tree. If you've ever checked out Willico, I was up there at Chico on Sunday. Uh, I saw some California gray squirrels running around. My daughter and I were looking at one run from tree to tree, as a matter of fact, while we were sitting up there. And you see that squirrels are constantly taking these, burying them for later use. It's not the only way that seeds get around. For example, birds take seeds all over the place. Some seeds, as a matter of fact, have adapted to only be able to germinate after they've been through a bird. And so they get taken far from the tree, deposited. And of course, that's great for the propagation of the species. They can grow somewhere far away from where they were originally dropped. Spores, on the other hand, if you look at the spores that were made, say, by this mushroom or would be made by this mushroom, um, they're incredibly tiny. We'll bring in um, one of the little puff balls. We'll talk about those in more detail and talk about how spores are so tiny they're carried by the wind all over the place. You can find spores virtually all over the planet. So it's a fantastic strategy when you're talking about how fungus spread themselves all over the world. Now, in terms of strategy, we could have looked at the entire mushroom, and we will in more detail later, but really I just wanted to focus on a couple of things. One, the gills right here, and two, the chitin, which is the outer cell, uh, cell wall as opposed to the cellulose cell walls that you see in plants. Let me change the screen here and show you what I'm talking about in terms of the strategy that these use. i get the right screen going here. The strategy that these use to not only reproduce, but a strategy, a strategy, strategy, no, that was from something else, a strategy that you see in nature again and again. Uh, you might recall that you saw Armadillo de Vulgaris, you might have remembered, they're the roly polies that we saw around our campus. The roly polies are crawling around here and they live in a damp environment. You want a damp environment, come to Pacifica. There's usually a lot of fog around here. The point was that they are closely related to a species that lives in the ocean. However, roly polies have adapted to live on land. As a matter of fact, they would not survive completely surrounded by water. And they have gills. They have gills that are they used to breathe with, but they require a moist environment to be able to function correctly. That's why they can dry out. That's why you see sometimes them rolled up and dried out and they don't survive if they get desiccated like that. Look at this right here. Those are gills. They're using the same strategy here. And as we led students through a dissection of their, of their fungus, their, their fruiting body, their mushroom right here, what we were trying to lead the students to was this idea. Again and again in nature, you see this idea of increasing the surface area for a given space. In other words, our lungs increase the surface area in the alveoli by making as much surface area as possible in a given space so you can do gas exchange, oxygen, of course, uh, entering the blood, entering the hemoglobin while the carbon dioxide leaves. Uh, you're trying to increase surface area there. The gills on both the fish and this mushroom right here um, we also talked about the folds that you see inside, for example, the small and the large intestine, uh, or the folds on brains. If you, we've all seen pictures, for example, of a human brain, all the ins and outs, the folds and the cerebral cortex. Those folds are there because you're increasing the surface area. In the case of a brain, for example, you're increasing the ability of the neurons to communicate with each other. So maximizing surface area using various strategies, for example, like the gills here, which do a great job of increasing surface area, vastly increases the number of spores you can get out of a single mushroom like this. Uh, one last thing we talked about in class today, and I'll go really quickly into the beer and wine, was the Miller and Urey experiment from 1953. This uh, was one of the things that led to Miller's uh, uh, Nobel Prize, Yuri already had a Nobel Prize, groundbreaking classic experiment. We had science from scientists here. They were putting together uh, polymers to make putty. Their reason for that was obvious because we tied it in with amino acids linking together to make proteins, amino acids, 20 of them linked together to make all the proteins in our bodies. And those are monomers linking together to make polymers. The polymer, of course, in this case, being the protein. When you're checking out this experiment, it was groundbreaking because it showed for the first time that you could take a vessel that represented Earth's ocean, Earth's early atmosphere. You could add a little bit of energy. In their case, they used a spark to represent early lightning. And you could make 
simple amino acids. I believe they made five amino acids during that particular experiment. Remember, 20 amino acids make all that we are, which is pretty awesome. And then finally, yesterday, we talked a tiny, tiny bit about a strategy for reproduction um, in the fungi kingdom that does not involve um, spores. It involves budding, which is when you have a yeast cell, a cell like this, and instead of producing spores, a small part buds or pinches off and then finally becomes free to, it, it is its own separate fungal organism. Uh, in particular with beer and the wine, the reason we focus on this is because if you look at a bad picture of a bottle right here with a cork in the top, let's go, let's go with wine for example. Of course you have sugars that are put in here courtesy of the grape juice. You add some yeast to it right here, so you have yeast in there. And if you were to chart the population of yeast, the yeast get introduced to the sugar solution, and then it's cork. You have a sealed environment. And for the yeast, it's a sugar party. It's like a bunch of kids at a birthday party with too much cake. They, if you were to plot time on this axis right here, and the population on the y-axis, you would see their population increase logarithmically. It would reach a high point, but remember, they are making, as they reproduce, CO2 and ethanol, or alcohol. So I'm going to put that over here. Alcohol. Ethanol, a form of alcohol. In other words, they're casting these off because the alcohol is literally a poison to them. They're literally trying to get rid of it through a metabolic process. Um, that should be a good lesson too, that alcohol is you know, literally a poison. That's why it's being cast off in this case. And eventually the population of the yeast, yeast maxes out and it drops off very, very quickly. What are you left with in this container? You're left with in uh, this container um, an alcohol sugar solution, which usually has CO2 in it. So that's a huge basis for the wine industry right here in California. If you've ever been up to Napa, the Salinas Valley, all the way down to San Diego, across the state, up and down the state, you see vineyards that in many cases, the, those, those grapes are on their way to feed yeast, which will then uh, make ethanol and sealed containers. And hey, you've got yourself a wine industry there. So uh, an incredible variety of food and incredible variety of types of fungus that we, are talk we can talk about in class. Uh, you could do a whole semester just talking about the amazing food products that we get from the fermentation process. By the way, that was one of our terms up here, by the way. Fermentation is this process right here. Fermentation is anaerobic respiration. In other words, they're pulling oxygen. They're getting the oxygen to do their metabolic process um, in an environment without using oxygen directly. They break down other materials to get their oxygen. It's far less efficient than respiration. Um, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about exercise, what it means to exercise aerobically, which means with oxygen, it's like jogging slow, you can do that all day, versus anaerobically, which means without oxygen, which is like doing a sprint. You can do it for a little while, but you can't keep it up because you're using this type of energy production. Okay, that's where I'll leave it today. We covered a lot of ground today, but I just want to give a quick recap. I'll put the notes out there online. Don't forget, our key term sentences are due by Friday, along with our online quiz, quiz for week 13, which is also due by the end of the day on Friday, and the links are out there in your Google Classroom. Have a great day, everyone, and I'll see you online and in class. Bye-bye.